Hi everyone, my name is Evelyn Beery and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Today I'm going to be talking about the ongoing spread of invasive species by the plant trade industry. The global plant trade is a really large scale and a highly profitable trade network that ultimately results in a lot of benefits to society, such as the cultivation of different important agricultural crops, uh, propagation of plants used in medicine and for other plant-based products, and for other industries like biofuel production and in landscaping. However, this global exchange of plants has some unintended negative consequences. And the thing I'm gonna be talking about today is one of those, which is the spread and impact of invasive plants. In the US, we have about 1,000 to 1,500 plants considered invasive. And these species range in terms of their characteristics and the habitats they invade. Of the species considered invasive in the lower 48 states, for about 30%, we actually don't know how they got here. About 10% were introduced accidentally, and the other 60% were brought here on purpose, with the primary introduction pathway being the import of non-native plants to be planted in our gardens as ornamentals. And that makes up about half of all invasive plant introductions to the US. Once we've figured out which ornamental species can become invasive, we would ideally hope that we stop propagating them and selling them as ornamental plants to prevent their further spread as invasives. However, considering the quantity of species invasive in the US and the huge proportion of nursery stock that's often non-native, it could be possible that some invasive plants are still propagated and sold as ornamentals. So for this project, we wanted to assess how successfully we've removed invasive plants from plant trade. And this is really important information to have because if invasive species are still sold as ornamentals, it's really kind of counteracting the time and resources we're putting into management. We started by compiling a list of all plants considered invasive in the lower 48 United States based on either state or federal government legislation or um, by the recording in the Invasive Plant Atlas, which is a database of invasive species information based on expert opinion. And basically to figure out what species were for sale, we did a lot of Googling. So for each of 1,285 species considered invasive, we conducted standardized internet searches for their sales and recorded a bunch of information about any kind of types of availability we found. And we also, so we used Google and then we also used a database of nursery catalogs run by the University of Minnesota libraries and collected this information for each species. Of all the 1,285 species we searched, we found that more than half were still grown and sold as ornamental species. Vendors selling invasive plants were uh, located across all lower 48 United States. And of the species we found for sale, we found that 44% were state regulated, meaning that within that state, they cannot be grown or sold legally. And then of the kind of 98 species consider considered to be federal noxious weeds, which means that these are kind of the most severe negative impact species that should not be grown or sold anywhere in the US, we still found 20 species for sale. I wanna let that sink in a minute and, and just to give you an idea of the scope of what we found, these are the locations of the roughly 1,000 vendors we found offering invasive plants for sale. And if you kind of put together all the sales across vendors and across species, it sums to roughly 15,000 opportunities to purchase invasive plants across the lower 48 United States. Most of these vendors were on the ground nurseries, but online marketplaces like eBay and Amazon were also really common in our database. Some examples of the high impact species we found for sale were Chinese silvergrass, which is kind of an up and coming invasive species in the Eastern US and particularly in the Southeast, where it outcompetes other native plants and it's been shown to increase fire frequency and fire severity. We also found a lot of sales of uh, Japanese barberry, which is also invasive, invasive in the Eastern US and particularly the Northeast. It's a really common ornamental shrub, but it can escape natural to natural areas where it forms dense thickets with thorns. And research has also found that it carries high densities of ticks with Lyme disease. And then another example is coven grass. And this is one of the federal noxious weeds we found for sale. And coven grass is really invasive on a global scale. So the IUCN considers this one of the world's most invasive plants, but we still found it sold by 33 different, different vendors in 17 states. 
And I want to point out that for Kogan grass, a lot of what we found for sale was supposedly a sterile cultivar of the species. But there's research to suggest that after a couple generations, the sterile cultivar can hybridize with the invasive variety and regain invasive tendencies. So it's still really problematic that we found sales of this species, even if it's marketed as this kind of supposedly sterile cultivar. So these are some of the commonly sold high impact species, but not all species we found available were equally invasive, nor were they often sold in the same place where they're invasive. So this figure here is showing you the number of times each species was offered for sale compared to the number of states where the species was regulated. And that kind of number of regulations can be used to infer how widespread the potential impacts of the species is. So for example, at the top of this graph, we have Japanese maple and panicled hydrangea. These are the two species we found most commonly for sale. Neither species is regulated in the US, but experts in the Northeast, based on that invasive plant atlas, um, cited that they found that these two species can naturalize outside of cultivation. But considering their widespread availability as ornamentals, these species are probably highly valuable to gardeners. So just speaking from personal experience in Amherst, where I live, we have Japanese maple everywhere. My parents have it in their backyard. It's planted along my street, outside my house, um, and it's really a widespread ornamental. So because of the popularity of these species and because we don't really have evidence of their widespread impacts, we might consider these kinds of species lower priority for regulation and management. On the other hand, we did find sales of some of these more middle of the pack species that are regulated in about 10 different states, which kind of suggests that they're, they have potential for widespread impacts. Um, but they were still fairly commonly sold as ornamentals. So anywhere between 30 and 60 vendors sold these species. For these, we might prioritize getting them off the market since they have the potential for widespread impacts and may only be moderately popular as ornamentals. So we can kind of use this, this trend of number of times offered for sale versus regulation to infer where we might want to dedicate more resources. We can also use these data to prioritize regulation and policy enforcement by looking at the regulated species we found for sale, and especially those that were sold as ornamentals in the same state regulating their spread. So one example is glossy buckthorn, which is a species that's invasive in the kind of eastern and northern United States. And what this map is showing you is the states regulating buckthorn, which are shown in pink, the states not regulating buckthorn, which are shown in white, and those gray points are all the locations where we found buckthorn offered for sale. And again, this is a regulated species. So this really highlights two things. One, we need to dedicate more resources to policy enforcement. So we, this is one of the species we found most commonly sold in the same state where regulated, which suggests that we don't have enough resources or we're not doing a good enough job enforcing the regulations that are trying to remove species from plant trade. And second, this shows that we have pretty inconsistent regulation. So here you can see that Indiana is not regulating buckthorn spread, but it's adjacent to states that are trying to get rid of buckthorn from plant trade and trying to manage their infestations. And so because this kind of patchwork of regulation, it's really difficult to eradicate invasive species at broad scales and especially to take them off the market because growers might have a difficult time understanding where species are invasive when you know it really varies so much state by state. If we look across all the regulated species we search for, we found 146 species sold in the same state where regulated and this is a huge problem. However, relatively speaking, most sales of regulated plants occurred outside of states regulating the species. So like that Indiana example, the people selling buckthorn in Indiana are not necessarily violating regulations. Um, and that happened a lot more often than species were actually sold within the state where they were regulated. So that suggests that regulations were generally effective at reducing within state purchase of invasive plants, except for this kind of handful of species that were sold in the same state where regulated. So to summarize, invasive plants are continuing to be spread through plant trade, including high impact and highly regulated species. However, the more often a species was regulated, the less likely it was to be available as an ornamental. And this suggests that regulations were generally effective at reducing sales. So we need to really dedicate more resources to policy enforcement to take invasive species off the market. Another means of reducing invasive plant sales is providing growers and consumers with more transparent and consistent lists of invasive species.
Compiling that list of species we wanted to search and finding the most up-to-date regulations was a surprisingly difficult task. And if neighboring states are not consistently regulating species, that presents a really big challenge for growers to stay in the know, especially if they're shipping plants and seeds ordered online, which we documented as happening quite frequently in our analysis. One potential strategy for reducing invasive plant sales is increasing regional collaborations. Regional invasive plant councils have already kind of taken form in some regions of the U.S. and increasing the information we share across states and collating lists of plants at broader scales might reduce some of the gaps we observed in regulation and, man and management. And it also might provide growers with kind of a one-stop shop place to get information on what's invasive in their area. So the main thing I really want you to take away from this presentation is that there's a lot we can be doing better to prevent the spread and impact of invasive plants, including stopping the propagation and sale of species known to be invasive. Coordinating regulation and management at broader scales and increasing invasive species awareness are two areas in particular in need of improvement. And I wanna end by saying that on a smaller scale, we can ask ourselves as consumers, are there non-native species in our backyards that we can replace with native biodiversity? Or the next time we plant our gardens, can we make a better effort to select native species? Something as simple as that can go a really long way to preventing the spread of known invasive species and reducing the likelihood we import new non-native plants that could become invasive. Thank you so much for listening, and this is ongoing work, so if you have any thoughts about how this research might be useful to your region or network, or you're interested in seeing the data, please feel free to contact me because I'd be happy to talk more about this project. Thank you so much for listening.